All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Deaf Fest 2017. It is my pleasure to welcome you here at the first lecture or presentation by Radek Šimko, who's come all the way from UK, England, from the belly of the beast, so to speak. There will be approximately one hour for the, for the presentation, with five minutes at the end reserved for your questions. Please send all your questions to the appropriate link, which is slido.com, and then the appropriate hashtag, this room is E2. So all the questions are going to the E2 room, and at the end there'll be uh, some space to talk about your questions. If your question, if your question isn't answered, during the time, you can also go to the speaker's corner, which is just around here at the lobby, and then you can talk to Radek there and delve some deeper into the issues of uh, information technology. All right, so without uh, any ado, it is my pleasure to present Radek Shimko. Thank you for... <laughs> I like the music, but I guess uh, we can... Uh, can We'll see. Uh, so hi, everyone. Is everyone awake? Just a yes. quick of show of hands. Who is awake? OK, good, good. Uh, so my name is Sarek Shimko, as, uh, as I've been introduced. As my name suggests, oops, as my name suggests, um, I'm originally from Czech Republic. Uh, so I speak Czech, but this talk will be in English. Uh, as of four years ago, um, I moved to England, to London. And I work for a company called HashiCorp. And you can find me on the internet pretty much everywhere as Radek Simko. Uh, so Twitter, you know, you can follow me on Twitter, raise my followers, and um, you can follow me on GitHub, etc. So um, as I know that you are all awake, um, I'm just going to uh, ask who is an operator here in the room? Who like, deals with servers mostly, infrastructure stuff? Okay, just a few hands. OK, four, five. So who is a developer then? All right, well, that's a lot of hands. Well, let's see. Uh, I hope that the talk is still going to be relevant to you because it's, uh, it's a lot about infrastructure. Uh, who uses Terraform here? OK, just a few hands. So hopefully we're going to raise that number after the talk. Uh, so let's talk about infrastructure as code because that's the title of the talk. But before we dive into um, infrastructure as code, I want to talk I want to take a moment to talk about the infrastructure and what do we mean by the infrastructure. So uh, we're going to play a very simple game. Uh, so shout yes if you see infrastructure on the slide. Is this infrastructure? Yes. Yeah. We call them RJ45, or so we call them network cables, right? Uh, is this infrastructure? <laughs> we call it a data center, right? Or a sysadmin, or an operator. Is this infrastructure? Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, we call it infrastructure as a service, usually. You can build your own network, obviously, spin up virtual machines, load balancers, etc. Right? Is this infrastructure? Uh, no. No? Yes. <laughs> Mixed feelings. How about this? We call it a workload scheduler, right? Or container scheduler, Kubernetes. How about App Engine? <coughs> yeah? Platform as a service, we call them. It's just similar to Heroku, obviously, if, if you're familiar with Heroku or Beanstalk on Amazon. Is this infrastructure? Google Cloud Functions? Yeah? Functions as a service, I think they call them. So infrastructure, what is infrastructure? It's many things, right? But these things usually differ in, uh, in a few aspects. So uh, they are different in terms of the operational experience that they expect you to have. Um, they are different, they differ in terms of limitations that they impose onto you. So what can you do? And they also differ in costs. So how much money uh, does it cost to actually use those services? Because uh, as you go from top to bottom, from the network cables down to cloud functions, you realize that you are letting your, the other people to make decisions for you, uh, which 
may or may not be right for you. It depends. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, costs and your needs mapped to those layers, basically. Now, let's talk about delivering infrastructure. How do people do that in these days, usually? So, you know, 24 hours before the deadline, <laughs> you know that, right? So you, as a developer, you come to your ops team and you ask them kindly, uh, you know, we need the infrastructure. We need to go live tomorrow. Can we do that? And uh, they'll probably give you this kind of look <laughs> or more likely this kind of look. And the reason they give you this look, most likely, is because designing infrastructure well requires knowing the app. So as an operator, you kind of need to know something about infrastructure to design, uh, something about the app to design the infrastructure. Um, and uh, you, know, you need to know the capacity uh, that you need to sort of design the security model and, and how does it behave under pressure, uh, et cetera. And this pretty much applies to all the layers that you've seen on the previous slide. You can abstract things, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, you still let the app choose some kind of capacity and scaling patterns. So you still need to, need to know uh, something. And it works the other way around. Designing the app well requires knowing the infrastructure. Again, you can abstract things, but if you're a developer, it does help to know something about infrastructure because you can build a better app. Uh, which scales really well, doesn't consume as much CPU, as much memory than it's necessary, and can, it can also be reconfigured easily. So you can swap to the database endpoints, etc. So let's, uh, let's have a look how people deliver, uh, the other way how people deliver infrastructure in these days. If you, if you have, so the, in the previous case, we had like slightly like mid-size or bigger company where you have the dedicated ops team and the dev team. And now if you're a small startup, usually uh, you say, you know, you're empowered yourselves to, to do it. So uh, you would go to the Google Cloud Console to create your new uh, shiny instance. You know, ask for, you need obviously enough power, you know, at least 32 v, uh, virtual CPUs. Um, and uh, you add the most important firewall rule, right? <laughs> Open the SSH to the internet, uh, just to later realize that it might not have been such a great idea. And, um, or you spin up a new database uh, and conveniently leave it open to the internet with uh, some hard to guess credentials, right? We all do that, right? <laughs> and maybe you like to realize that your single instance that you spun up has reached its capacity and you are no longer serving your customers. Yet you still have to pay the bill. So um, let's take a look at how people deliver software today. Um, so delivering software usually involves uh, using VCS, you know, like Git, versioning control system. Uh, so you commit your code, give it a commit message, push it to a feature branch, and then uh, raise a pull request, obviously, and we have a conversation about the code, right? Uh, which helps us discover the bugs before they reach the production and uh, make other people familiar with the code so we can reduce the, the effect of, of the bus factor. And then we respond to the feedback and eventually reach consensus and the PR is approved and merged and released. So what if we could treat infrastructure as a code um, and deliver it very in, in the same way? So what do we mean by the code in here? You could configure your instance using the shell scripts like you can see on the slide, you know, install the packages, enables the, the, the services, etc. Or you can uh, do it in a more modular and a flexible way and uh, 
and um, use uh, those tools that you can see on the slide, like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, or Salt Stick. And uh, that's also a code. Uh, you know, we call it configuration management. Some of you are probably familiar with some of those tools. And uh, if we take a peek at the, 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 the layers, those tools would fit in, in, in here, basically. So they apply when you have an operating system already running. And that's not what I'm going to talk about today. That's just one part, one small part of the infrastructure. It's a very important part, but it's just one part. Uh, HashiCorp, which is the company that I work for, makes tools for developers and operators. And we try to help them automating some of those layers that you've seen. We make six open source tools. Uh, Vagrant, which is uh, our tool for managing development environments. Uh, Packer, which is for uh, building machine images so that you can scale easier and, and, and quicker. <coughs> Uh, then Terraform, which is the, one, the tool I'm going to talk about today. That's for infrastructure management. Uh, Nomad, our uh, solution for, uh, uh, for uh, basically workload scheduling. So our workload scheduler, which allows you to schedule not only Docker containers, but different kinds of workloads. Uh, Console, that's a, a service discovery tool, uh, which also allows you to do health checking make sure that your service is all healthy and they can discover each other. And finally, Vault, which is our secrets management tool, which allows you to, to, to store secrets securely. And uh, we also have a few commercial offerings, uh, which is how we make money. Uh, so infrastructure is a very overloaded term. So let's uh, take a look at what you can manage uh, by Terraform. So we have here some cloud providers, you know, Google Cloud, Azure, AWS, um, DigitalOcean, CenturyLink Cloud. So those are sort of traditional, uh, traditional clouds. And we also have a packet, which allows you to spin up like bare metal servers. And uh, also Heroku, which is like uh, the platform as a service. Um, but Terraform also enables you to control like Bitbucket, GitHub, which are the version control system, not necessarily the data in them, but the repositories, maybe some metadata around these repositories, uh, users, teams on GitHub, etc., or Datadoc and Librato, which are monitoring services. You can also control uh, some metadata around databases, uh, like, again, not the data in them, but uh, like uh, users or roles in uh, MySQL or Postgres, uh, some schedules in PageDuty. Um, but the most relevant provider to you here is probably Google Cloud. And uh, as you may or may not know, uh, we have a partnership with Google. And uh, Google has dedicated full-time employees working on the Google Cloud provider, helping us to make, make sure that uh, we stay up to date as they are releasing new features. So let's take a, take a deeper look into Terraform. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about HCL, which is a language that we use to describe the infrastructure. Then uh, efficiency, how do we make sure that Terraform is efficient and why that's important? And uh, why you probably want to pick a tool which covers the whole life cycle of your infrastructure, which is what Terraform does. And finally, if we have some time left, we're going to do a demo. So HCL, so-called HashiCorp config language. Uh, if we set the manual management of your infrastructure aside, because usually that doesn't scale very well, um, even if you're not using Terraform, you would be building your own scripts using language, sort of high-level languages on the left side, um, like Python or, or Go. And uh, you would be dealing with all of the idiosyncrasies and complexities of those APIs and you would be generally building imperative scripts. Um, and later on, you would realize that you need some help from the, from the data languages, like JSON or YAML, because you can't really hard code like the details of infrastructure all in, in Python or Go, right? Uh, and so the, data, the, the languages on the left side provide you a plenty of ways to shoot your source in the food. 
you know, they give you like classes, functions, and for loops, etc. It, it has a lot of complexity because the languages were designed to, to solve a slightly different problem than uh, describing infrastructure is. And on the other side, the languages for data were obviously designed for, to, to transfer the data. So they lack these complex features. And uh, they also, however, lack features which you may find useful when describing infrastructure. That includes uh, things like referencing or comments. I mean, you can have comments and referencing in YAML, but has anyone tried that? If you tried that, well, give it a try. You'll see what I mean. So um, that's why, despite the designing a DSL is a, is a huge challenge, uh, both Puppet and Terraform has chosen that path. Uh, so HCL is a separate project, um, which you can find on GitHub. It's open source as most things that we do. Uh, it is used in various HashiCorp projects, uh, like Console, Vault, Nomad, and Terraform. And uh, it is also JSON compatible, which uh, is quite useful uh, if you need to generate the code. Uh, you may ask, why would I need to generate the code? Um, so here is an example. Uh, that's, uh, GDS is a, is a government digital service in the UK, and they take advantage of this in their solution for DNS management. Um, they basically take the zone files for the DNS, then they translate that into JSON, hand it over to Terraform, and then Terraform creates DNS record in GCP, uh, Dyn DNS, and root 53 in AWS. So that's, uh, that can be quite handy. Then uh, moving on to efficiency, how does, why is Terraform efficient? So we have a, an example of a config here, an instance. I don't have a pointer, but um, uh, basically, you can see that we define the resource, uh, then the type of the resource, which is instance in this case, um, and then reference name, which allows us to reference the resource elsewhere in the config. Uh, and then we have some attributes which you know define the type, how big is the instance, what's, what's its name, um, uh, where do we launch it, um, and what OS do we choose. And then uh, we have the DNS zone, because if you have an instance, you might need to expose it to the internet, um, or generally use DNS. And um, here we create the zone, and then uh, the, the DNS record. And before you can create the DNS record, you obviously need the zone. And so that's, uh, that's where the, uh, the syntax down there, the uh, reference syntax comes into play. So you can see that we are referencing the, uh, the managed zone uh, there, the name of the managed zone. And also using this, ref the, this reference syntax, we can make sure that the zone gets created first. Then uh, at the same time, we can also create the instance because we can't create the DNS record before the, the instance is, um, is up. And this is Terraform in action. Uh, first, you run Terraform plan, which tells you what's going to happen before it's going to happen. So here we see basically three instances being created because nothing exists yet. And um, uh, as we are happy with the plan, we can run apply. And apply basically tell, does exactly what I just said. So it makes sure that it first creates the zone. Then, uh, well, at the same time, it can start creating the instance. So it does multiple things in parallel, which is what, again, is, makes it efficient. And then uh, finally, after the instance and the zone are available, we can create a DNS record, which is the last step, basically. And uh, what really happens behind the scenes, uh, just to give you a deep dive, Terraform basically creates this kind of graph. Um, and if we go from bottom to top, that's, that's how Terraform basically processes the graph. So uh, uh, it allows it to, uh, to make the decision which, which operation takes place first and last. So we first set up the cloud provider uh, Google in this case, we make sure that we have connection, we set up all the credentials and all that. And then at the same time, uh, we can create instance and the zone, and then eventually 
the record. So uh, that's how it works. And you can actually uh, generate this graph yourselves if you have a bunch of configs describe which uh, have, you have used to describe your infrastructure. You can run Terraform graph and it will give you the, the output that you've seen on the previous slide. If uh, you want to know more about how graph theory applies to infrastructure as a code, you should definitely watch this talk from a colleague of mine, Paul Hinzi, uh, who is the head of, head of infrastructure at, at HashiCorp. Uh, and uh, that's, that's really useful. Uh, useful talk to watch. Um, so moving on to life cycle. Why covering the whole life cycle is probably something you want. So how would you usually create resources using the CLI, using the, the sort of native tooling, gcloud? So you would create, you would run gcloud, compute instance, create da 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 da. Uh, then you would create the bucket, uh, assuming you need some kind of static data, um, and then the DNS record. And later on, uh, you would realize that you need to probably update those resources, even though some people think that you know we just create the stuff and that's that's like step two production. We can go, right? Uh, but actually, you need to update the stuff as well. So let's say you need to replace an instance, uh, which uh, means you need to follow these sequence of steps. You need to create a new instance, give it a new name, uh, create the new DNS record, um, and then uh, basically remove the old one, and then delete the old instance. And in order to know this sequence, you need to know how the API works, usually. And you need to figure out what's the right ordering of those steps. And that some fields may conflict with some other fields. And uh, eventually, because no app is done until it's deleted, uh, we need to delete the resources as we are decommissioning the app. So um, you, know, you again need a bunch of different commands to do this. And uh, Terraform has this thing called schema. Uh, it's not something a user has to worry about. Uh, so it's sort of, uh, it, this is a snippet of code from the, um, from the code base of Terraform. Uh, it's not something you would deal with, but um, just to give you, uh, give you an idea of how, how it works under the hood. Uh, we have this schema where we describe some metadata about each field. Here we say that the identifier of the database in this case is a string, that it's optional, but we can't update it, which is what the force new true says. So if you, run, if you try to change that field, uh, the identifier, uh, and run plan, then uh, Terraform will tell you, hey, I'm going to re like recreate the resource, basically. So make sure that, um, that like, be aware of that, that it may incur an outage. Uh, and then we also have some metadata which tell you which fields conflict with other fields, and we do some validation prior to sending requests to the API. Uh, the other uh, sort of internals of Terraform, which uh, users may find useful, is waitress. So uh, because most APIs are asynchronous, uh, which is usually good because you know, it allows them to scale very quickly and easily, um, you usually need to have some kind of attributes to connect all the dots together, as you've seen on the graph, and usually don't have some attributes available until the instance is up, for example, um, like IP address, so you can't point the DNS record to it, and that's how we achieve basically synchronicity uh, on the asynchronous APIs. Now, here is an example of, uh, of a plan uh, which tells you that you're changing a mutable field because a mutability of, of a resource depends on a field, as I said before. So here we are creating, uh, we are adding a new metadata field, role in this case, and we can do that as the instance is running. So that's, uh, that's a mutable field, that's easy change. Whereas if we try to change an immutable field, uh, in this case, the name of the instance, because name is used to uniquely identify the instance, we can't quite do that. So that's what, that's what the red forces new resource says, and the plus minus. So it tells you, hey, it, this, this may actually cause an outage, so be aware of that. So I think it's time for the demo. And 
before I jump to the demo, let me show you what I built. So here we have, I built it the proper way. Usually people just spin up cluster and expose it to the internet. Uh, and I tried to build it the right way, which means we have the bastion host up there, uh, which is the only host that's exposed um, to, uh, to this IP address here. Uh, and then we have the cluster of uh, some workers, which will accept some work, uh, which run console and nomad, um, and then some service which hold the data, the, the state of the cluster effectively. Uh, so we Sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> cool. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so we have some some users here, uh, which basically uh, go through the DNS and then to the load balancer, which points them to the workers. And then we have a sysadmin uh, connecting to the bastion host. Oops, let's see. Try to switch. Hmm. Right, so, oops. I don't know what's this odd thingy here. Let me try to fix that. No, that's not that. Well, not sure how to do. Remove that overlay, honestly. Let's see, second try, no. Anyway, um, you're gonna, just gonna put it up here, make it smaller. That's the solution, right? <laughs> sort it. Um, so what we have here, is a provider, and uh, we also have a data source defined here. Uh, data source is a bit different to resources, which I'm gonna show you in a bit. Uh, let me open compute, for example. Let's meet a bit. So we have some resources here. Which, and resource, each resource has um, what we call a CRUD interface, which means you can create, read, update, and delete the resource. Whereas data source is basically just the R from the CRUD. So you can only, uh, you can only read stuff. And it's useful for, for uh, things like zones. So let's imagine that you need to create one instance per zone, or you want to create an IP address per zone, or a subnet per zone, and things like that. So you can do that using this data source. It basically pulls out. It also allows you to make your configs very re reusable. So if you move between regions, because you, know, you have region, and then you have zones within the regions, they differ. And um, it makes it, oh, didn't want to expose that. I have to rotate. Um, so let's review the plan. We have 44 resources. Right? Who likes to, I love watching the terminal. Who likes to do that as well? Yeah, I gather that there, will be, there, won't, be, there won't be that many people. So, um, so let's, uh, let's take a look at the configs instead. So we have a load balancer here. Um, for the console uh, UI, because console has a UI. I'm also gonna use Fabio. Fabio is basically a load blancer, which allows, uh, which talks to console um, and allows it to know which service, uh, which instance of the service is healthy. Uh, so where we can route the traffic and which, which services is dead. And we have some health checks here. Uh, it's, it's not interesting. Let's skip to something more interesting. Uh, security. So we have we are opening the port uh, 22, but only from the bastion host. So we can use these variables here. Uh, variables allow us again to make your make our configs reusable. 
So if we open the variables file, you can see that I have some variables defined here. And that allows me to uh, give my configs to a colleague of mine or to a friend of mine who may have a slightly different infrastructure. They may run in a different region or uh, they, want, they may want to give different names to their services. So uh, that's uh, quite useful. And then we have just a bunch of firewall rules. So that's not that interesting, I guess. Um, what else do we have here? The network, that's interesting. So we have the network here, uh, and then we have the subnetwork. Uh, so we have private and public, because as I said, I did it the proper way. Um, and then uh, I need to create the, the internet gateway route, so to make sure that all the packets are routed to the internet when they, when they need to need to be rooted there. Um, and uh, this here is a route for, for the NAT gateway. Um, so basically, this only applies to the Bastion host, and this is for all the other uh, nodes in the cluster. And here I'm building the Bastion host. So instance group manager here allows you to basically build uh, reusable blocks, which um, means that you can like scale up and down very quickly and easily. So if your instance dies, you just say like just kill the instance, and another new one comes up. Uh, with the exact same configuration. Uh, so here I'm just saying, because Bastion host, I only need one Bastion host, that, that's why I have the target size one here. And here's a template. So I'm using CoreOS. Um, it's quite a uh, nice, very lightweight uh, operating system, very much container focused. So you can run the container workload there. And uh, here is a special field, uh, sort of meta stanza, uh, that we support for all resources in Terraform. And then, uh, because by default, if you have if the resource requires replacement because you are again changing an immutable field, like changing the name, and by default it will try to destroy the resource and then create the new one, because uh, you would otherwise run into like name collisions. And here is a way to reverse that behavior. So it would first create uh, the new one and then delete uh, the old one. And obviously, update any any references uh, in before delete before after creating the new one. But it obviously requires you to uh, to have unique names. So let's see if yes, it's uh, came up. Let me make that bigger. I hope you can see that all in the back. Uh, you're going to SSH to the Bastion host. Uh, and obviously, you all do this, right? Don't give me that look. Uh, now we're going to connect to one of my, he's going to guess the IP. Yeah, I'm on a server. And let's see if the console clusters, uh, console servers were able to find each other. So we have six, um, make it slightly smaller. We have six servers, six nodes here. And you can see that they were able to find each other. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's quite useful. We have three servers here and three clients. And the reason they were able to find each other is because uh, we have this fancy config here. We have an agent, uh, and we basically say, we try join, here's, the, here's the, the part that's responsible for bootstrapping the cluster. So we leverage the tag names uh, within GCP. Uh, so as we give each instance a tag, and the tag is the same, uh, then we leverage the API to find the instances using the tags. Now, uh, here comes the, uh, the, 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 the meaty part. We also have Nomad. And let's see if Nomad can also reach out to, to, other, to all the instances. Cool. So we have Nomad cluster. And now 
I have a few jobs to schedule. So let's see what do we have here. We have Fabio, that's the load balancer, as I said before. And here is a con uh, the config for the Fabio job. In this case, um, I say to which data center do I want to schedule it, that it's a system job, which basically means that I'm going to schedule that job to every single node in the cluster, which is usually suitable for something like Load Blancer. Uh, and I'm going to use the driver exec, which means that I'm just going to run a binary. So I don't need to wrap every binary in a Docker container in order to uh, run a job in, in Nomad. So that's what I'm doing here. I have the artifact. I'm just going to download it off to uh, GitHub and then run that and check the checksum to make sure that it's the right uh, binary and give it some resources like CPU and, and memory. So let's schedule Fabio. Oops. Right, so because we have obviously three nodes, then uh, Fabio was scheduled to three nodes. And we can see if Fabio is running. It's pending still. So um, I'm going to run watch and see if uh, it comes up. And in the meantime, we can take a look at the other job that I'm going to schedule here. Who likes pugs here? Any pug lovers? No? Yeah, I don't have a cat demo, I'm sorry. Sorry to any cat lovers. Uh, so I only have a pug dispenser. And the, the way pug dispenser works is that it dispenses pugs. Um, and um, depending on the zone that you reach, so where the instance is running, in which data center, you get a pug of a different color. Um, so we will see uh, if the load balancing actually works. And uh, here we have uh, basically the service uh, service type of the job, which means that it can run anywhere. It doesn't need to have one instance per every node, uh, but we create six of them. So there will likely be two on each node. And here we leverage Docker. Uh, so I pushed uh, an image earlier to, uh, to Docker Hub. And um, here I'm just setting up the port mapping and uh, I'm e exposing it uh, through the load balancer here as well, just to make sure that it's available on slash pug dispenser, which is how uh, Fabio works. That's how I tell Fabio that it should expose um, the service that way. So Fabio is running here, as we can see. Oops. Well, hopefully you can see that. And we can schedule pug dispenser. And as you can see, it allocated, created six allocations. And let's see, it's all running. And hopefully, close that. We have this useful command called Terraform output, which gives us all the outputs, um, which is useful for the operator. We can uh, inspect the console UI, which tells you Obviously, which services are uh, healthy and which are not, which ones are not. And we can tell that it all looks healthy. We also have a nice UI for Nomad, which tells us that, uh, you know, our uh, pug dispenser is, is running in six instances. It's consuming some, uh, some resources here as well. And finally, Um, uh, 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 here we go. It's finally, eventually, hopefully, if the demo goes, oh, that's because it's 404, obviously. Pack dispenser. Here we go. Red pack that's served from uh, US West A. I'm not sure you can see that. Uh, but <coughs> basically, let me make that smaller. Here we go. So you can see that served from 2A. If I refresh, it's blue pug from zone B, uh, A, and here's the green pug 
as from zone C. So the load balancing is working, as you can see. So it's a very simple demo, uh, nothing too complicated, and uh, I have one more slide to, to finish off. So to give you a summary, what you should take away from this talk, think about what, you, what your needs are, what you need uh, in terms of you know, what kind of operational experience do you have within your team and within the company uh, before uh, jumping to conclusions and choosing solutions and tools. Uh, think about the limitations that these tools impose onto you uh, and the costs, how much they cost, obviously. Um, Nobody has unlimited budget, maybe except a few people around the world. Um, and treat your infrastructure as a code because uh, that helps you to share the knowledge and uh, you know share it really with your with with your other teams within the ops team and with your dev teams as well. Um, so thank you for the attention and thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. I think we have some questions here. So let's see which ones are um, interest, most interesting. Do we have any gifts to, to give out to? No, we don't. OK. Mm. So um, that's sort of comparisons. You want me to compare other tools to Terraform. How would I use Terraform to manage my own infrastructure, not cloud? So I think I need some clarification to this one, because what do you mean by your own infrastructure, your own VM in, in, a, um, in a data center? Or I don't know who asked that question, but uh, it's the second one. So it's basically, for example, if I own, well, in my company, there's a data center. Mm -hmm. And I went to the like to code my infrastructure and to make the deployments in that data center. Mm -hmm. um, is there like an interface that we will have to to create, or how would I make Terraform or tell Terraform uh, to deploy the machines in my data center? So I guess the question is, how do you automate the process, or do you presumably have some tools to automate parts of the process already? Uh, I assume your machine would boot with an image which has something. You would possibly use something like OpenStack on yeah. top of that. So if you have OpenStack, then uh, there is a Terraform OpenStack um, provider which can help you. Uh, and hopefully, take a look at that. Um, and that allows you to create all the OpenStack resources. Um, So let's see, OpenStack. That's one of the community managed uh, providers. I think it's one of the well managed. And uh, you can you know, create uh, things like block storage volumes, um, the instances, key pairs, et cetera. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yep, yeah, thank you. Um, so what else do we have here? Oh gosh. Uh, you said that HCL was JSON compatible. Uh, but the config files you showed are not JSON parsable as this. What did you mean? Right. So um, each, um, each config that you've seen can be translated into JSON. There is like a, uh, we, we use uh, different parsers based on the extension, I believe. Uh, so if you, you can pass uh, a JSON file to Terraform, uh, and it obviously uses JSON if it has JSON extension, and it would, it would just work. Uh, I'm not sure we do a very good job at uh, documenting the JSON format. It's something. Uh, it's 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 a place for improvement, certainly. Um, but it's something we want to address in the nearest uh, major releases. Uh, just a few language improvements that's coming, and that's. Uh, that will be in there as well. So you will really want me to, are there any other questions? Um, I mean, I'm, not, I'm happy to answer like, uh, you know, compare the tools, but I just, uh, I would just prefer to do that off record. 
Uh, not, I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of the tools. It's just because uh, uh, we have partnerships with Google, and I like, OK, let me answer that on record then. Um, so Google Deployment Manager uh, uses, um, I think, YAML. That's the main language that allows you to describe the infrastructure. And um, it obviously, Google Deployment Manager, because it's made by Google, it only allows you to manage your Google infrastructure. Whereas in Terraform, you can go cross provider. Uh, so it's provider agnostic. And uh, in terms of the language, uh, as I said, YAML is a data language. Uh, so Google themselves even recommend that you use uh, Jinja, I believe, which is the templating uh, engine um, used in Python to, to solve the reusability problem, uh, which HCL is supposed to solve. So you can use one language in Terraform, as opposed to a templating engine on top of YAML. Um, I guess, uh, to be fair, uh, there are probably some advantages and reasons why you would prefer Deployment Manager over, over Terraform. Because um, I think some parts of Deployment Manager might be generated. Uh, so um, they uh, might be more uh, sort of up to date. Um, <coughs> but again, we have two full-time employees from Google uh, working on the Google provider. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's useful uh, as well. I guess uh, one other feature that you may find useful in Terraform as opposed to Deployment Manager is the dry run. You've seen the plan that tells you what's going to happen. And um, you only saw the addition, but maybe let me show you, let me demonstrate what happens if... I try to change the name. And because I have an existing infrastructure that's already running there, it's going to refresh. It's going to figure out what's the current state, because it may have changed in the meantime, because someone may have gone to, to the Google Cloud Console and changed something manually. So Terraform will make sure that it, it's got up-to-date state. And here I can see that you know, you don't, I don't believe that you have this feature in, in Deployment Manager. Yeah, so, you yeah. You can update. You can update Jinja uh, and all the templates and reapply it and uh -huh. just click on the button and do it through the G Cloud uh, command. By, right. But does it tell you that if you change this specific field, it's actually not going to update it, but it's going to replace the whole thing? Uh, I'm not sure. No. Yeah. So you will have this overview. You can do a dry run and mm -hmm. it will show you the differences. Right. But it depends what the API, what the underlying API, how, they be, how it behaves, yeah. right? So uh, yeah, I think I don't. I'm not that familiar with Docker Compose, um, but I believe that Docker Compose is mainly aimed uh, at your local environments. Prove me wrong. Uh, I'm you know I'm not really that familiar. So um, can we hide the like top three questions so we can if we have some time to answer more. Yep. Uh, so we get to. Uh, yeah, because I think there is eight questions, and I only see three or four. You can scroll it. Oh, OK. How do I scroll it? Here we go. Oh, here we go. Can you easily switch from one cloud provider to another? Or is there configuration time somehow to the one you picked in the beginning? So this is a common question that we get. Because when we say it's provider agnostic, people think, uh, so I'm just going to create this config, and now I say I want GCP, or I want AWS, or I want DigitalOcean. That's not quite how it works. Because uh, most people don't realize that there are some really significant differences in between those clouds. And if you did that, if you built that abstraction layer, which some companies probably have done, um, you would lose the benefits that you get from each cloud provider. Um, so um, uh, it's not quite easy. You, you can probably build that, uh, but you would still have set of configs for, for GCP and set of configs for, for AWS. Um, but you use the same language, the same syntax. So that's the, that's the benefit. And you can also make the instances or your services in AWS or in one cloud provider and another talk to each other and reference the like, IP addresses from one to another and other, other attributes. So that's, that's the benefit that you get. 
I answered that one. Can we use Terraform for both production and dev environment deployments? That's an interesting one. So it depends what, uh, what do you have in your dev environments? Uh, is it like, is it cloud also? Is it just a separate, uh, separate network in the cloud provider? Um, or is it some, is it like a VM that people run on their machines? Um, if it's a VM, then your developers run the, their local environments locally, like literally locally, then Terraform is probably not the right tool. If it's, uh, if you run your local environments on some uh, cloud alternatives, like, uh, forgot the name, but there's basically implementation of AWS, which you can run locally on OpenStack, I believe. And they expose custom API endpoints, which you can then set to the AWS provider. So it talks to different API endpoints and not, uh, not AWS.com. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Radek, but this is yep. all the time we have, guys. Cool. But the conversation is still going on. I'm sure Radek will be in the speaker's corner to right. answer all your further questions. If you want to delve deeper into the issues, you can also speak there. And uh, there's a cute organizer here standing here. And he wants to ask you for your feedback. So on your way back, please uh, interact left, with him left side. somehow. Try the left side. And uh, to recap, the speaker's corner is uh, in the lobby just around the corner. OK, thank you very much. And uh, see you there.